You know, I believe there are moments, decisions that are made in every movement that determine the fate of the cause. It comes down to a choice that is made often by one or a few to lean back or fall forward, to take a personal risk or play it safe, to play nice and you know, make friends with those in power or create the tension needed to demand real change. Think about the, a moment for Mother Till. Emmett's mother, who decided to leave her baby boy's casket open, which led Rosa Parks to think about why she was giving up her seat on the bus and why she refused to give up her seat that night, which began the Montgomery bus boycotts, which led to four students walking into a lunch counter in Greensboro and refusing to get up from the lunch counter. Friends, I'm here today to ask you to do something that's never been done in the history of the world. I'm here to ask you, the American church, to join, to join with the pro-life generation to put our nation back together in a post-Roe v. Wade world. I'm here to implore you to help us achieve our mission that has thus far spanned five decades to move it from Washington, D.C. to state by state, to city by city, to church by church, to make abortion an unthinkable and un unavailable option. I'm here today to ask you to make a decision for life, for millions of lives. And this isn't simply a rhetorical question, it's serious significant. Quite frankly, it's time to saddle up and ride. For the past several months, my family and I have been traveling across the American South. And every town, you know, the history that we go through causes me really to pause and reflect upon the tragedy our nation experienced in slavery and the Civil War. And as I conduct interview after interview about the leaked Supreme Court decision that signifies that as of February, five justices voted to finally right the egregious wrong of Roe v. Wade, I continue to be asked about what that will mean sending the decision of abortion, abortion legality back to the states, what that will mean for the future of our nation. During these conversations, I can't help to think back to what happened after our Civil War, the Reconstruction effort, a topic that's rarely discussed in our culture or history classes, its failure, and finally, the civil rights movement in America that finally saw success 99 years after the surrender at Appomattox. For decades, black Americans lived with regular discrimination and Supreme Court sanctioned segregation and fear of night rides of the Klan and those in authority who simply looked the other way. And through our own inaction, the most powerful institution in our nation, our church permitted it to go on. It was in solitary confinement in the margins of a newspaper that Martin Luther King wrote to white clergymen explaining the price of inaction and pleading for action. He wrote, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in a stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternity realistically feels that he can set a timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding for people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute understanding, misunderstanding from people of ill will. He went further though to say, there was a time when the church was powerful. It was during this period that early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat, a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. But things are different now. The contemporary church is so often weak, ineffectual voice with uncertain sound. 
Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consumed by this church's often vocal sanctioned of things as they are. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early Christian church, it will have lost its authentic ring, forget the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as a relevant social club with no meaning. Sadly, it took a hundred years from the end of our Civil War until the passage of the Civil Rights Act to achieve what Martin Luther King deemed a positive peace. It took the murder of a little boy named Emmett in rural Mississippi and then his murderer's acquittal that led to one woman refusing to give up her seat, which led to marches in the streets, freedom bus rides, student-led lunch counter sit-ins, which resulted in days and weeks in jail, stinging pain of water hoses, death threats, bombings, and assassinations. Friends, it took 99 years. The hour is nearly upon us that we have all worked for. Some of you have been working for before I was even born. Step one of our mission, step one, which was reversing row, will be complete. But we have so many more steps to go. And the American church must rise. And you must lead it. We cannot, we cannot tolerate decades more to reconstruct our nation, to put back together what the Supreme Court broke in 1973. Make no mistake about it. The battle that is coming in the next few months will be physical, political, and spiritual. In our city streets, the violence that so many support behind the closed doors of a Planned Parenthood will be committed openly and justified by many in power. In state houses, those who we've worked to elect, who've pledged to stand with us, will be forced to finally act. They will be casting votes to determine the fate of abortion laws, the fate of millions of lives in their state. And I predict some of those who said they were with us won't be there when the final tally comes in. In our homes, our daughters and our granddaughters will be ordering chemical abortion pills shipped from overseas to states that may have banned abortion. But these pills will come right to her or to her friend's house. And they will result in injury, infertility, and possibly her death. She'll be aborting her child in her bathroom and returning to the scene of the crime every morning when she brushes her teeth. In our workplaces, men and women will be hurting from past abortion decisions, made to finally reckon with a choice that they might have made decades ago. In our church, what will we be doing? Will we simply be a thermostat or a thermometer? A thermostat can transform our society, or a thermometer just reflects it. I believe it's not too late for us to stand and be a thermostat, but this relies on each of us, each of, each of you who are in this room. First, today I'm asking you to commit to compelling your church to act. Talking to young people about the predatory abortion facility in your neighborhood, convincing your pastor, which only 6% have given a sermon in the past year on abortion, convincing your pastor to have the courage to speak, to start a ministry for post-abortive men and women who are hurting in your church, for women and families in crisis who need help right now. The first step I would encourage you to do is join Standing With Her Sunday on August 28th a national simulcast with groups like Turning Point Faith and Support After Abortion and Family Research Council, Students for Life, who are getting together to arm the church, to stand with her in a post-Roe era. The second thing I would ask you to do is envision what your community, what your city will look like without abortion. Ask yourself what you, your church, what your business must do to help ensure that women and families in crisis can be connected immediately to those who can help them. And don't be afraid to think big. 
You know, when I launched Students for Life 16 years ago, newly married, just turned 21, I remember the uh, often very well-meaning suggestions from many of my mentors who said, we love your passion, we love the excitement of going to college campuses to intercept young people from the predatory abortion facility, but you know, reversing Roe versus Wade, becoming that post-Roe generation will never happen. And you need to be careful about saying that because it makes people think you just aren't in touch with reality. I challenge you to remember who it is we serve, the creator of the universe, what he has and can do through us. And finally, be a messenger. Quell the flames of fear that Planned Parenthood is sending down to this generation. Show them, and I know I probably shouldn't say it's a conservative event, the progressive view that we have for our nation. That it is 2022, not 1922. No woman should ever have to choose between the life of her child and her education or career goals. We are actually the progressives. They are the regressives in this fight. Tell America about the 3,000 pregnancy resource centers and more than 400 maternity homes that vastly outnumber the fewer than 600 abortion facilities in our nation. Know the resources that are available in your community. You can go to standingwithyou.org, supportafterabortion.org, ab abortionpillreversal.org. Have those sites ready. This is fundamental. This is fundamental. This year, Students for Life and our team, we've knocked on more than 120,000 doors right here in Denver and 19 other cities. In neighborhoods surrounding abortion facilities, 73% of the neighbors we speak to don't know all the nonviolent alternatives that exist in their community. They have no clue that the pro-life movement for 50 years has been starting, supporting, and sustaining an entire social apparatus. Friends, when the Supreme Court finally reverses its anti-science Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Dovey Bolton rulings in the next few weeks, this month, what decision will you have made? What course of action will you take to determine the fate of this movement? The greatest human rights struggle in the history of our world. You know, in the course of um, my family's travels this year, I've been honored to take my kids to Appomattox, where the Civil War ended, to the battlefields in Gettysburg and Vicksburg, which were the keys to Union victory. I've shown them an old mansion uh, down the road from where I grew up that was the last stop on the Underground Railroad in what was Virginia at the time. I've been to Montgomery where Ms. Parks refused to give up our seat, took the kids to the lunch counter in Greensboro where the students refused to vacate. And in every history uh, homeschool field trip stop, I asked my children what they would have done if they think, if they would have had the courage to do the hard thing, to make the hard decision, to stand for vulnerable others facing injustice. But now, I no longer have to look back into our history and ask those questions of ourselves because history is happening right before us. Today, will you make a decision to seek a positive peace, to stand for innocent children and alongside their mothers and families, getting to work to ensure that in a post-Roe America, no woman stands alone? Or will you simply embrace a negative peace? For me, my family, the pro-life generation, which is active on Nearly 1,300 campuses, has more than 150,000 trained alumni. For this generation that I have the honor to lead, I can absolutely tell you, we will seek the positive peace. Thank you.